First I think let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, as we come before the throne of grace, we ask your special blessing upon us. Speak to me, through me, and for me, and let your name be glorified. Father, when we ask for the forgiveness of sins, and we ask for a special blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 While I was driving here this morning, I was trying to sing in the car. And suddenly I realized that my voice, I got some. My voice um, just went. And uh, this don't usually happen. I just pray for me while I speak. Amen. Amen. For those of you who love titles, I have entitled the message at Stormy's Place. <clears throat> at Stormy's Place. I don't have a sore throat or anything. I just, my voice doesn't. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> God was thinking about you long before you ever thought of him. And when I use the word you, I include myself. In, a, in, a, in a plural sense, it includes all of us. Amen? Amen? His purpose for you predates your conception. And that's from the book Purpose Driven Life, page 21. God was thinking about you and me long before you and I ever thought of him. And his purpose for us predates our very conception of him. But supposing that he needs you to be poor or sick or uneducated by Canaan's standard or crippled or single. God created us with purpose. And we say, well, God has a purpose for my life, and I'm going to excel. I have great goals and great potential. But what about His purpose for us? Some of the people who have been of most use for God are people who have been blind can speak, people who had some physical deformity, have uh, been be the greatest blessing to God. And I hope that you will consider the message that I'm about to bring this morning. The city had been in a state of high alert. The National Guard was deployed. And uh, strangers were being detained, questioned, and sometimes interrogated. Because it had been so for many days. And they had reason or concern to be alarmed. It all started when a bunch of bedroom uh, Israeli dwellers, Bedouin tents, they made out of skin, pitch across the Jordan. And the old folks tried to comfort the inhabitants of the city because almost 40 years before, these bunch of former slaves who had devastated their the owners had been there before, but they had retreated because they thought that they were afraid of the height of the walls of the city. Many armies had left in frustration because when they came up to the walls of Jericho, the walls 
uh, impregnable, uh, fortified. It could not be breached. So uh, they had to live in frustration. So the old folks called, comforted the, the inhabitants of the city and said, it's not much of a concern. But what concerned them was the stories that they heard about this bunch of Israelis. There were ten dwellers in the Sinai Peninsula. And they heard stories about this bunch of slaves who had left Egypt, stories about the crossing of the Red Sea and dry ground, stories about how they ate bread from heaven and had a pillar of fire by night so that they can, they would not be in the total darkness. And they had a pillar of cloud by day to keep them from the hot desert sun. They heard the stories of their shoes did not wear, not their clothes on their backs did not wear. And they drank water from a rock. And they carried their God with them in a little box. And how they had devastated all the opposing armies that came up against them. If you, if you heard stories like this, then that's reason to be concerned. If, you, if they had pitched their tent right across the Jordan, there was reason to be alive. And uh, they must have told to themselves, well, they're coming to get us. And they didn't get sick. And the story is like, like, like God had dried, their God had dried up the Jordan River to make a safe passage. And they, they, they survived for 40 years in the wilderness. Can you imagine what story is? I turn your attention to what was going on in the city from the, from the alleys, even to the mansions, to the harbors, even to the airy few places, this was the talk. In the hidden metropolis of Jericho. You know, God had told Samuel, don't look at the height of his stature or on his countenance, because I have rejected him. God does not see as man sees on the altar, but God looks at the heart. Amen. And this is one of the reasons why when, when, when Lucifer began to spread, spread, spread rumors about God, the angelic host did not believe him. Why? Because they did not look, they could not see what was with him. They saw a bright and shining being, one who was in the very presence of Almighty God. And Lucifer was created first, he was the best. If God had to destroy Lucifer and create another, it would be the same because God could not improve on Lucifer. Mm. The Bible says he was perfect in the day that he was created. God had blessed him with, 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 with vocal cords that was beyond our imagination. He could sing all the parts at the same time. When Lucifer would sing, as a matter of fact, that's a good name. Because Lucifer means light bearer. Amen? Somebody will say amen. <laughs> no, no, nobody names their children Lucifer today because of the bad connotation that is attached to his name. But Lucifer is actually a good name. It means light bearer. So when he would sing, he would sound like an entire choir all by himself. He had influence, he had potential, he was bright, he was in the very presence of God, so the angels could not see, but God looks at the heart, amen? 
God does not see as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance. And that's why God has allowed time to play on. And what's on the inside sooner or later shows up on the outside. Amen? Mm -hmm. I turn your attention to the book of Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. Turn with me if you can. And we're looking at verses 27 and 28. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but within full of dead men's bones, and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. These were the Pharisees. They wear long robes. They said long prayers. They had an influence over the people so much so that the people told them to disobey the Pharisees. It was like disobeying God himself. But Jesus saw within. And he said, you are like dead bones. All dried up. You have no life in you. And in the book of Luke, chapter as a sorry, John chapter 2. John chapter 2, turn with me. We're looking at verses 24 and 25. After Jesus did many mighty works, he said, But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. And it needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Christ knew all of us. Amen? Amen. All our righteousness is as filthy rags. We look good on the outside. We like people to think well of us. And uh, after we have come to the Lord through the years, we know the right paths, what to say, how to say it, when to say it, how to greet each other. But inwardly, God knows us better than we know ourselves. Amen? Amen. He knows every single one of us. And God has not made us judges. Because there will be surprises in heaven. And as the preachers have gone before from this, uh, let me say what they have already said. There will be surprises in heaven. Because the folks who you thought would be there will not be there. Amen? Amen. And the folks who you did not think would be there will be there. And the great surprise is that you and I are there. Amen? Amen. <laughs> By God's grace and mercy alone. Full of their bones. This was the leaders of the church. The leaders of the church. I want to read a passage from Ezekiel 37. Seeing that I do have some time, I'll be done by 12 30. Amen. That gives me at least 45 minutes. Ezekiel 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me. That's ordination. He carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley <coughs> which was full of bones. That's transportation. And caused me to pass by them round about. That's investigation. Verse 3, and he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? That's interrogation. And I answered, O Lord, God, thou knowest. That's affirmation. Verse 4, and he said unto me, prophesy upon these bones. That's indoctrination. 
God's Father said, breathe on these bones. That's inspiration. Verse 7 says, and bones came together, bone to his bone. That's organization. Or breathe, or breathe upon these bones, and that they may live. And they stood upon their feet, that's elevation, and they became an exceedingly great army. That's dedication. Some of us have no idea what this, what this passage means. But the Bible explains itself. You know the story. Look at verse 11. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. These bones are the whole house of Israel. So when Jesus said to the religious leaders, you are full of dead bones. This represents Israel. And sometimes God uses individuals in the most unlikely places and unlikely situations unbeknown to us. And we begin to imagine, can it be possible? Jesus came out to grow up in one of the most wicked places known in his day. One of the disciples who was not yet acquainted with Christ said, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? As our caption for our study today, I take you to the book of Joshua, chapter 2. I want you to pay attention to what I'm going to say. Amen. Joshua chapter 2 is a very familiar passage of scripture. And Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into an harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. Two undercover Israeli soldiers sent by Joshua to spy out the land. Now this is where I get my title for the message. You see, Rahab in the Hebrew means stormy. So that's why I have a title of the message, Stormy's Place. Now, now this was a hollow, the Bible said. She was a remarkable individual. As a matter of fact, Bible scholars believe that she was among one of the five most beautiful women in biblical times. Along with Sarah and Esther and Rachel and the woman at the well. He said the woman at the well. Yes, I said the woman at the well. For a woman to attract five men and still so, she must be something, what do you say? <laughs> so, 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 Miss Rahab was among this group, but she was the ordinary harlot. She knew how to run a business. She had vision. She was an uh, uprising, um, Entrepreneur, she was a very successful in the business. She wrecked in the money. Because the Bible says, when the spies came in, they lodged in her house. Now look at verse 15. For her house was upon the town wall, and she dwelt upon the wall. No, 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 she was in the penthouse. Now this was prime real estate. 
prime property, to be living on a city wall, to have your house, and by the way, this she was not leasing. The Bible says it was her house. Business was good, amen? To be living on a city wall, on the penthouse, near the wall, that was good real estate, prime property. She could buy you out. Amen? Because we want to take a different look at Stormy's house. We want to take a fresh look at, at Rahab's. Sometimes when you hear the story, we think about only the heart, Rahab. But God uses individuals who we have no idea. Can God use? You see, see we cannot question God's living. Amen? Somebody ought to say amen. amen. You and I are in this story. Now maybe she had a sign painted kaleidoscopical bell and breakfast available for the right price. I don't know. But whenever any travelers came into town through the gates, because the city was walled around and you had one entrance in and one entrance out. Amen? So the first sight that they behold was Rahab's house. And these were not ordinary travelers. These were merchants, these were businessmen, these were men of elite. And they found her, themselves in her house. And the Bible says, now you don't have to be too imaginative or too descriptive to know what I'm talking about, amen? And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in here tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. Verse 3, and the king of Jericho said, said unto Rahab, saying, Behold, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they become the search out all the country. Now if you read the Hebrew, the king did not send his soldiers, his men, to take the men out of Rahab's house. The Hebrew says, now Rahab, would you please? That's what the Hebrew says. The king said to Rahab, would you please? The king asked Rahab's permission. Now, now she was a woman with, with high contacts. Amen. That the king had a relationship with Rahab. The king knew who Rahab was. That's why he did not just send a man. He said, would you please? That's what it says in the Hebrew. He had to get her permission. Amen. She was no pimp. She was no, not a person on the street. She knew how to run her business. She made money. And lots of it. She had her own house, a penthouse, living near the gate on the wall. So the king had reason to say, would you please? One second. She was a businesswoman. Amen. And she had vision. She ran a business well, maybe better than you and I run our business. And it came to pass that about the now before that, in verse 4, the Bible says, And the woman took the two men, and hid them, and said thus, There came men unto me, but I wist not whence they were. I don't know where they were. Now, now she lied, and some of us capitalized that, that Rehab lied. Did God justify the lie? No, he did not. She lied. That's what harlots do, they lie. Raise your hand if you have not lied. If you have not lied, Jesus says, if you broke one of these least commandments, you have broken them all. Amen? <coughs> How did she recognize?
recognize that these <coughs> that these men were foreigners. That these were <coughs> that these were Israeli soldiers. How did she recognize the difference in these men? Circumcised. <laughs> well, let's not go quite yet, because she did not get it with these men. Let's start reading to the story what it is not saying, amen? She had respect. She knew that these men were different. They were not a regular class. Maybe the way they dressed, they dressed dignified. Maybe the way they spoke, they did not spoke loosely or suggestive. They spoke as ambassadors. They represented someone else. Their mannerism was different. They were very courteous. They were pleasant. And she recognized that there was something different in this man. You see, as people of God, we need to conduct ourselves in such a way that as we are professionals, because we are ambassadors for the kingdom. Amen. Sometimes we, we, we try to be very flippant and, 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 and laugh about everything, but, but God means exactly what he says. Amen. Whenever we are God's errands, we ought to be business-like. Amen. We are dignitaries for the king. So maybe she recognized that these men are different. These are Israeli soldiers. <coughs> Undercover. By their speech, by their deportments, by their dress, the conversation. And she decided to protect these men even with her life. Because lying to the king, that was treason. And the punishment was there. But she believed in taking risks. Amen? I believe she had taken many risks in her life before. Now she knew how to lie. Her lie was very convincing. Very convincing. And I spent a lot of years in the prison and uh, Some of the, the, the best liars are in prison. Just how about that they just got caught? They lied through their teeth, just like Rahab. And they are so convincing. She said, I don't know where they went. Verse 5, and it came to pass about the time of the shutting of the gate. When it was done, this is her speaking, and the men went out. Whether they went, went I, I would not. Pursue after them quickly, for you shall overtake them. Go after them quickly. You might overtake them. And she brought them up to the roof of the house and hid them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order upon the roof. Flax was a plant. And from that plant, she would weave it and she would make rope and baskets. And she also had dye, that she would dye the merchandise. That was a cord that she weaved together from the flax, that she was able to let the men down through the window in the basket that she had made. So she also had a family business on the rooftop. She was a businesswoman, amen? She was very persistent. <coughs> she knew what, was she, what she was about. And when these Israeli soldiers made her way to her house, she recounted and recapped the stories that she had heard about this bunch of slaves. She heard stories. Verse 10 says, look at the first line in verse 10.